Um, OK, so let's, uh, let's just uh, jump right in and see uh, how vision and olfaction start. Uh, I'm uh, going to, uh, from the outset, I'll tell you that I'll talk primarily about the first stages of these two sensory systems. So um, I'm not going to talk about the psychology of seeing and the psychology of smelling. I mean, in some sort of in subjective sense, the sense of vision seems quite different to us from the sense of smell. Vision we uh, perceive as sort of an analytical sense. It allows us to actually describe in detail and measure things in the world and so on, whereas um, uh, uh, smell, our sense of smell doesn't really have that analytical feel to it. I'm not going to talk about these subjective impressions. Um, of course, you know, if you were a rat, you might actually have the opposite opinion. You might find that the sense of smell is much more analytical than your, than your sense of sight. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about what happens uh, uh, deep in the brain when uh, things get interpreted and memorized and, uh, and, uh, and the value judgments put on them and so on. I'll talk about the very first stages of processing in the early part of the sensory system, partly because plainly that's where we actually know the most, uh, where we, we think we understand things and can compare them adequately. So how does information get into these two sensory systems? Here's a cross-section of the uh, beginning parts. Um, and uh, for several slides, I'm going to have on the left something to do with vision, and on the right something to do with olfaction. Yeah? So on the left here is a, a section through a human eye. Uh, this is the cornea and the lens. And uh, uh, back here in the back of the eye is the retina. And the retina is this uh, thin sheet of uh, uh, nervous tissue. Uh, the image of the outside world gets projected onto it, like in the, on the film in a camera. And the job of the retina is pretty much like that, that of the film in the camera, although I'll expand on that later. But uh, first of all, it has to convert the light that gets imaged on it into neural signals. And then it starts processing those signals, and we'll learn something about that. And the result of all that processing comes out of the retina through the optic nerve uh, to the brain. So this is a section through the optic nerve that runs from the eye to the brain. Um, sense of smell. This is the a section through the head of not a human in this case, but uh, a rat. Uh, and you can see there's this large nasal cavity. Uh, in, uh, the, the nares are here. That's where the air enters. And the air carries odorants, and they swirl around in here. They bind to uh, receptors that I'll show you more about in a moment uh, on this uh, nasal epithelium. Uh, that's where the, the uh, chemical uh, interaction ha takes place between the odorant molecule and the receptor neurons. And those receptor neurons then project their axons to a structure in the brain called the olfactory bulb. It's pretty large here in the rat. And then from there, the signal gets processed further in the, uh, uh, in the cortical areas of the, of the brain and also the hypothalamus and other subcortical regions. I'm going to be talking mostly about what happens inside the retina, what sort of neural processing and signaling and detection and so on goes on there and what happens inside the olfactory epithelium and the olfactory bulb in the case of the um, smell system. So <clears throat> let's go through this. Uh, the physical stimulus are uh, light rays or photons in the case of vision, right? The photons fly in straight lines and they uh, uh, hit the retina. Uh, in the case of olfaction, the physical stimulus are molecules, odorant molecules, some, some kind of vapor that enters the nair and then, you know, the air sort of uh, flies around in this turbulent fashion around the, um, the olfactory epithelium and allows the odorant molecules to bind to the receptors. The next stage, and we'll, uh, we'll see this in more detail later, uh, are the receptor cells. These are the so-called photoreceptor cells in the case of the retina. These green things that I've indicated here, they are the ones that absorb the photons. Over here, there's a whole epithelium, uh, a whole surface of receptor cells that lines the nasal cavity, and they interact with the odorant molecules and send their signals on later to uh, st a separate stage in the olfactory bulb. And then the next stage are Second order neurons, in this case, so-called mitral cells in the olfactory bulb, they receive signals from the receptors and then send their axons on to other brain regions. And in the case of the retina, the signal ultimately gets to the so-called retinal ganglion cells and they send their axons on through the optic nerve to the brain. Now I want to gradually zoom into this picture and uh, in each case compare what goes on on the left in the visual system to what goes on in the olfactory system. So first of all, let's take a look at the receptor neurons. So this is now a little slice of the retina that I've cut out here. And I'm showing the photoreceptor cells. 
Uh, these are the uh, uh, rods and cones that you're well familiar with. Uh, they uh, absorb light and turn it into a neural signal. And I've illustrated three of them here for, uh, um, uh, for simplicity. Uh, the uh, photoreceptor cell has uh, a so-called outer segment. This is the part that is actually light sensitive. Uh, it has a so-called cell body. That's where the nucleus resides and the uh, uh, mitochondria and so on in order to make energy. And then it has an output end that's the so-called synaptic terminal. That's where the information gets passed on to second order neurons like bipolar cells. The, uh, Olfactory receptors, they uh, sit in the olfactory epithelium. This is, again, a modified epithelium, just like the retina is really a modified epithelial, uh, epithelial structure. The olfactory receptor has a, a cell body and then a dendrite that comes out of it and uh, a number of cilia, uh, so sort of very thin processes that uh, wave in the mucus that lines the nasal epithelium. So there's a thin sheet of fluid that uh, lines the epithelium here. And uh, it's these cilia that are the sensory elements. That's where the odorant molecules bind ultimately and cause a transduction event, about which I'll say more in a moment, that uh, lead the cell to produce a signal that it sends to the brain. And just as we have several types of um, uh, visual receptors, photoreceptors, we have several types of olfactory receptors. Um, it's, um, um, the number of different olfactory receptors is much larger. We have about 350 different kinds of olfactory receptors that are specialized for different sorts of molecules uh, that they sense, whereas we have only three types of cones and one type of rod in, in the retina. So the number of types of different receptors is much larger in the olfactory system than in the visual system. But I'll tell you in a moment that uh, that comparison is not necessarily the most interesting way of thinking about these numbers. Okay, let's zoom in further to the individual receptor neuron. So here is a, uh, a schematized cone photoreceptor. This is one of the light receptors. Yeah? Uh, there's this outer segment uh, that's a part of the cell that has uh, many sort of invaginated membrane discs. So it has a huge amount of membrane, really, uh, but it's folded in this very convoluted structure. Uh, and then there's the uh, uh, cell body and inner segment, and then there's the synaptic terminal. The interesting part, namely the actual sensing event, uh, are, happens in the, within the outer segment. So it's really the outer segment part that we, we need to understand. <clears throat> These uh, membrane discs contain a lot of uh, this uh, protein called rhodopsin, which is the uh, actual light absorbing protein. A photon hits rhodopsin, causes a biochemical change, more about that later. And that ultimately leads to a change in the membrane channels that uh, reside in the, in the membrane here. And these membrane channels are pores for ions like sodium and calcium. And when the conductance of these channels changes, less sodium flows into the cell. And that leads to a change in the membrane voltage of the uh, photoreceptor. And that ultimately changes the amount of, of transmitter that's released from the terminal. Did you get introduced in earlier lectures to the sort of basic principles of membrane conductance and channels and uh, voltage and how they transmit the release is dependent on voltage and so on? Okay, so this is, is really a classic uh, neuron. Uh, it uh, gets input from the outside, which in this case happens to be by light. And that input changes the conductance of the membrane and the change in membrane conductance ultimately changes the amount of transmitter released from the terminal. Yeah, so in that way, it operates like many other neurons. It's just specialized in the way it receives a signal from the outside world, which happens to be light in this case, rather than transmitter from some other neuron. Yeah. So, so a time yeah. trick is sodium going in? Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. I'm, I'm, I'm zooming in gradually. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, uh, the effect of light is to actually block these channels, is to close these channels. So less sodium comes in. Sodium is positively charged, so when less sodium flows in, the membrane potential goes negative. So what you actually get is a little downward going blip in the membrane potential. It's the opposite of classical. Exactly. So in some sense, uh, if you want, uh, darkness is the stimulus for the photoreceptor. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's stimulated by dark, it's inhibited by light. Yeah. Um, it's so Yes. As a result of the yes, and there's a whole chain of biochemical events that's on the next slide that goes from the rhodopsin to the channels. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, I'll show you that in, in a moment. Yeah? But the, the basics of it is that uh, activation of rhodopsin leads to a closing of these ion channels, which leads to a so-called hyperpolarization in the jargon anyway, a more negative membrane potential. Okay, on the right-hand side, this is uh, an olfactory receptor. Uh, it has this uh, dendritic stalk and the cilia coming out the top. And uh, it turns out that uh, if you look closely at these, these two cells, they share some morphological similarities. They're both uh, ciliated epithelial cells. So they derive from uh, sort of an ancient precursor uh, of uh, an epithelial cell that had small, uh, I don't, haven't drawn them here, but has small microtubular ciliary structures in it. Uh, anyway, so there, there are these, these uh, peculiar histological similarities between uh, the cells, but I hope to convince you that there, there are more similarities than that. The interesting transduction events happen out here in these uh, cilia that are floating around in the, mu in the mucus. And uh, here the uh, event that triggers everything is the binding of some small molecule, some odorant molecule to a receptor. And then again there's a bunch of biochemistry that happens between the receptor and the membrane channel. And uh, in this case, activation of the receptor opens membrane channels. Uh, more calcium flows in. That leads ultimately to more sodium influx as well. And you get a positive blip in the membrane potential. This positive blip in the membrane potential triggers an action potential ultimately. So this, uh, the neuron fires a spike, one of these all or nothing events. You heard about these two, right? Uh, one of these all or nothing action potentials. And that travels down the axonal fiber all the way to the olfactory bulb in the brain. So uh, the, the two receptor cells are both uh, specialized in the same way. There's sort of an inner part that takes care of housekeeping functions. And there's an outer part that's very specialized for the sensory transduction that's necessary uh, for, uh, for, for the cell to function properly. So let's look more closely at this, uh, the biochemistry of the sensory transduction. So what I've illustrated here is for the photoreceptor, the link between rhodopsin and the uh, membrane channel. And here's how this works. It's very schematized, of course. Uh, rhodopsin is uh, a, uh, one of the family of so-called G-protein coupled receptors. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's called that because it links to a G-protein. A G-protein is sort of a generic um, uh, uh, theme that one finds a lot in uh, cell biology that uh, links receptors to internal events in the cell. Um, in this case, the G protein is called transducin. That's just the name it got in the, in the course of uh, uh, elaborating the biochemistry of vision. Uh, <coughs> the G protein, in turn, when activated, uh, activates another um, an enzyme called the phosphodiesterase. And this is an enzyme that can hydrolyze this small molecule called cyclic GMP. The cyclic GMP is a cyclic nucleotide that acts as a second messenger in many different places in the, in, in the body. Um, a second messenger, again, uh, is uh, uh, a theme that one finds a lot. It's a small molecule, typically, that uh, connects one membrane-bound event to other events in the cell. And so in this case, the phosphodiesterase hydrolyzes this molecule. The cyclic GMP happens to be a ligand for this membrane channel. And uh, when cyclic GMP is present, the channel is kept open. But when cyclic GMP gets eaten up by the phosphodiesterase, the concentration drops and the channel closes. Yeah? And that's how we ultimately link absorption of a photon by rhodopsin through this chain of events that has a minus sign in here to the um, closing of the membrane channels and the reduction in the conductance of the membrane. Yeah? Is that channel a sodium channel or a calcium channel? This is a, a sodium uh, channel. Uh, it also passes calcium. Um, uh, but uh, not um, uh, uh, potassium, or with, uh, with much lower, um, lower conductance for potassium. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a huge number of rhodopsin molecules. Uh, one, one photoreceptor cell, one rod cell, I seem to remember, has something like 3 times 10 to the 8. Uh, that's uh, 300 million, oh yeah, it's approximately a number of uh, uh, citizens in the US or so. <laughs> uh, anyway, so a very large number of, uh, of um, uh, rhodopsin molecules. In fact, 
they are packed so densely in, these, in this membranous structure, uh, in these lamellae, they are packed so densely that uh, it, it, it's almost like a solid. Uh, so they actually get in each other's way in a significant uh, uh, way. It's been shown that the uh, diffusion of, uh, of uh, molecules within these disks, as they're called, is hampered by the fact that there's so many of them. So they're, they're, they're really packed very densely. Yeah? Uh, it's, not, it's not just binding. Phosphodiesterase actually turns this molecule into something else. So it uh, turns it from cyclic GMP into GMP. Uh, so it, it, changes the, it changes the structure of this uh, small nucleotide. And then uh, that can no longer activate the channel. And how long does that last, this, this um, interaction with the molecule? Uh, this all happens very fast. So from light hitting here, to channel closing here is something on the order of milliseconds, thousandths of a second. So when the when the photon is gone, then uh, everything has to come back to normal. Yeah, and the way it comes back to normal, I haven't drawn here, but it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting chain of events. So obviously, if you've hydrolyzed cyclic GMP, you have to make it again. So there's a parallel enzyme called a guanylate cyclase that makes cyclic GMP from a GMP. So it pretty much reverses the action of this enzyme. Yeah. And so that brings cyclic GMP levels back up to where the channels are open the normal amount of time. Or the, uh, um, there's some, uh, but there's uh, um, a lot of interest in the uh, pathways that, uh, that implement this recovery, recovery from a light response. And, and the reason is this. Um, this light response is extremely sensitive. Um, a, a single photon will actually produce a measurable signal in a rod photoreceptor and a and measurable change in its synaptic output to the bipolar cells. In fact, it's been shown that people can see single photons. Um, so if you, uh, if you do the experiment carefully, bring someone into the dark for a long time so they're completely dark adapted and then show them very dim flashes of light and ask just the right questions, you can convince yourself that it's possible to see a flash of light that contains only one or maybe about two photons. Yeah. So a single photon has a, 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 real, a, a strong measurable effect. And uh, the, 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 uh, the, the reason is that these pathways are, have a very high gain in them. They, they amplify the signal a lot. Yeah. So, uh, for example, a single rhodopsin activates, I think, between 100 and 1,000 G proteins. Yeah. Uh, each G protein is associated with just one phosphodiesterase, but a given phosphodiesterase can chew up uh, 1,000 or 10,000 molecules of cyclic GMP in the course of one photon response, one single photon response. So in the end, uh, you get a, a substantial change in the uh, flow of ions through that channel, through these uh, channels, there are many, many membrane channels, uh, as a result of just one photon absorption. The downside of this, so you've got this big amplifier that gets ramped up uh, with a very high gain, uh, the downside is you have to shut it off again. Yeah? And because each of these uh, steps got um, ramped up in, in activity, you have to turn them all off again and make sure that they, they stop. Yeah? And so it turns out that there are intricate uh, feedback pathways that I haven't drawn here, but they, uh, they, they start with calcium uh, that normally goes through the channel. When the channel closes, calcium can't come through anymore, and the calcium concentration declines inside the cell. And it turns out that that decline in calcium concentration has an effect on almost all, I think perhaps, all of these stages of the amplified cascade. It actually <laughs> leads, it leads to a more rapid shut up, a shut off of rhodopsin. It leads to a turn off of the, um, of the G protein. And it also accelerates the sister protein to this, uh, the guanylate cyclase, which then restores the cyclic G levels. So it's a very good question. And there, I think probably uh, th this, uh, this uh, activation uh, a part of the cascade was sorted out, I think, about 20 years ago. And uh, in re recent years, most of the interest has been in the parts of the biochemical cascade that turn, the, turn this amplifier off. So all the different feedback pathways that exist to shut the single photon response down again. So that's in the absence of photons. You're saying that's going to happen. Right. So if, if, you, if you imagine what happens, if you just put a single photon into this rhodopsin, into the entire photoreceptor cell, just a single photon, 
the, this, uh, this cascade gets ramped up to high speed, but then it has to be shut down again. Yeah? And the time course of it is about, uh, uh, it depends on a bit on what photoreceptor you're, you're, you're working on, but let's say for a, for, a, for a primate cone, like one of our cones, it takes this about um, 40, 50 milliseconds to ramp up to the peak, and then the response comes back down in another 50 milliseconds or so. So everything is over after a tenth of a second. Yeah. Um, that's actually fairly slow when you compare this to um, how most other neurons work, right? They fire action potentials in a millisecond. They can fire several hundred action potentials a second. Uh, the integration time, uh, you know, the time over which they listen to their synaptic inputs before they fire an action potential is more on the order of five to 10 milliseconds, yeah? The photoreceptors are, are uh, some of the slow, slowest neurons in the body. They take about a, you know, 100 milliseconds to think about what they ought to do. Yeah? Uh, and that's actually a serious concern with regard to vision because uh, a lot of things we have to do with our visual system require that we do them fast. Yeah? Uh, uh, you know, as you're driving along and the car in front of you hits the brakes, you see that brake light come on. The time between then and your foot going onto your brake pedal is about a tenth of a second and all of that a lot of that time is spent doing this biochemistry. Uh, uh, really, a lot, a lot of that tenth of a second is hung up in the photoreceptor cell. Yeah? Once it comes out of there, the subsequent stages of the visual system are kind of catching up with how slow the photoreceptor is, and they're trying to compensate for it, but there's only so much you can do. So uh, anyway, so this, uh, even though we think of this as being fast, you know, biochemistry that's over in a tenth of a second, it's still slow compared to uh, uh, the, the needs, ecological needs of, uh, uh, of, of animals. Okay, um, let's look on the right-hand side of the picture. So uh, the biochemistry of transduction in the olfactory system, um, <clears throat> it ends up looking quite similar, and not just because I drew it that way, but uh, uh -huh. uh, it, it really is very similar. So uh, we again have a G-protein coupled receptor. Uh, in this case, these are called olfactory receptor proteins, and uh, it binds a, a chemical ligand, more on that later, uh, activates a G-protein, uh, it's called the G-ALF for obvious reasons. Uh, the G-protein in turn activates an enzyme called adenylate cyclase. And the adenylate cyclase makes a molecule called cyclic AMP, which is another small nucleotide, small cyclic nucleotide. And uh, it acts as a ligand on a membrane channel. And uh, that channel in turn uh, uh, conducts uh, sodium and calcium into the cell. So you can see the, uh, the uh, pathway is almost the same, except for this minus sign here. Yeah? So here, the G protein activates an enzyme that destroys the ligand to the, for the channel. And here, it activates an enzyme that makes the ligand for the channel. Of course, uh, this enzyme has its uh, sister enzyme. That's a diesterase that destroys cyclic AMP. So that, you know, again, the response can be balanced and can be, can be turned off again. Uh, but other than that, uh, other than this connection from uh, the G protein to the effector, the, uh, the two pathways look quite similar. It turns out they're also similar on the molecular scale. Uh, the way this channel was found is because uh, we knew what this channel was and you could, you could find it by homology. Yeah. Uh, these olfactory receptors were found, were found by homology, sequence homology to rhodopsin. Yeah. Um, the uh, G proteins are reasonably similar. Um, of course, these uh, nucleotides are quite similar, except for you know, guanine versus adenine here. Uh, so on the, on the actual molecular scale, on the uh, molecular level, there are quite close similarities between these, uh, these two biochemical cascades. And I mentioned the uh, sort of uh, uh, shut-off system in the photoreceptor uh, cell uh, involving calcium as a feedback. You can find that same feedback system in the olfactory neuron as well. Uh, where, where the, uh, uh, the change in the influx of calcium alters the way these earlier parts of the cascade work. Yeah? How similar are the olfactory receptor and um, That's in the next slide. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I was going to zoom in even more. Uh, at some point, I'm going to stop zooming in and I'll zoom out again. Yeah? But uh, this, is, this is the last. Uh, the last stage. So let's take a look at, at the molecular level at the actual receptor proteins. Yeah? Um, so here's a, a sketch of uh, rhodopsin. Uh, 
uh, rhodopsin sits in the membrane of the, of the cell. So the membrane you, sh you should imagine as being a, a flat sheet that extends like this. This is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. Uh, <coughs> rhodopsin is, um, is um, a one of the family of seven transmembrane helix receptors. Yeah, and they're, they're called that way because they uh, contain uh, seven alpha helices that span the membrane. And um, uh, the, um, uh, and the, uh, the inside of uh, some of these inside loops contain the regions that are in contact with the G protein and that, uh, that interact with the G protein and ultimately activate it. Interesting thing about rhodopsin is that it's not just protein. Uh, there is uh, hidden inside the uh, protein, sort of cradled in these uh, seven transmembrane helices, is a small molecule called retinal. And um, uh, here's the structure of retinal. Um, <coughs> it's, it has a ring and then uh, a sort of a coordinated carbon chain and then an aldehyde group at the end. Yeah, it's also called retinaldehyde sometimes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> it comes in two forms. Uh, the the so-called 11 cis form, which has a kink here, and the all trans form, which doesn't have that kink, so that the coordinated carbon chain goes uh, uh, stretches in a straight line. It's the kinked form that is bound in rhodopsin, and this is the molecule that really does the light absorption. So without that molecule, there would be no light absorption by rhodopsin. This is what absorbs a photon, and when a photon hits, miraculously, it turns the kinked form into the straight form. And because the small molecule, this is called the chromophore, it's, it's sort of the, the, uh, the light-activated part of the, of the uh, opsin, um, <coughs> because this molecule is cradled so tightly inside of these seven helices, when it sticks out its leg and, uh, and uh, turns to the straight form, that pushes these helices around. It changes the shape of the rhodopsin. And as a result of that change in shape, something happens on the inside. We don't quite understand the mechanics of this, but something happens on the inside that alters the way rhodopsin interacts with the G protein and uh, makes, the, uh, makes it excite the G, the G protein. Um, well, with, within the chromophore, you can think about electron transfer. You know, what makes this, why does a photon send it into an excited state that then relaxes to that? And so there's, there's some interesting photophysics associated with how the electrons travel along this chain, but not electron transport between the chromophore and the protein, or even within the protein. Yeah. So we think of this as basically being a mechanical interaction between the chromophore and the protein. The chromophore changes its shape in this, in this uh, re remarkable way, and that just you know, pushes the protein around and alters the conformation. But th th this is recognized as hand-waving. Yeah? We, we uh, no, no one has seen this event happen. Yeah? We, don't, uh, we don't have a comparison of the rhodopsin forms with uh, 11 cis and with all trans. We don't know exactly what happens down here to these loops and how they change their, their conformation to alter the interaction with the G protein. Um, but uh, uh, many experiments have been done to show that this step is the essential step in, uh, in visual transduction. It's, uh, in some sense, the only step in all of vision that requires light is <laughs> the switching of this small molecule from this state to that state. Everything else doesn't require light. Uh, the protein itself or the rest of the biochemical cascade doesn't interact with light at all. Yeah? yeah. Um, okay, so there, there are different ways of getting blinded by very bright light. Uh, in, the, in the extreme case, um, um, let's say you know, you've, you've, you've looked in, in, into the sun for a second, and then you've got this sort of blind spot that travels around with you, right? In the extreme case, uh, you may actually have uh, bleached uh, all or most of the uh, uh, opsin molecules in the, in the cone photoreceptors. Bleached, what that means is that uh, 11 cis turned to all trans and then needs to be regenerated. Yeah, so there is again the, a whole enzymatic machinery that's involved in reversing the process I just told you about. Yeah, so there, there are 
uh, and it's, it, it's, it's um, a lot of stuff is involved in that. So for, in particular, uh, let me back up for a moment. After this happens, after 11 sister goes to all trans, and the uh, uh, rhodopsin gets activated, it activates the G protein. The next thing that happens is that all trans falls out of the rhodopsin protein. It actually can't, uh, it, 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 it doesn't have room in there if you want. It, it doesn't fit well into that binding pocket and leaves. Yeah? So it actually leaves the, uh, the protein. It then gets picked up by an enzyme that turns it back into the 11 cis form, you know, uh, puts the kink back in. And then it gets reincorporated into the rhodopsin, and now you're ready to go. Now that process takes quite, a, uh, quite some time. It takes, uh, takes seconds, yeah? Or 100 seconds even. Yeah. Um, so if you're in a situation where you've, you've looked into the sun and you've uh, actually bleached, meaning uh, uh, converted all of your, all of your uh, opsin proteins, then it takes some time to recover because this uh, has to be turned back into the 11 cis form, has to be reincorporated in the protein, etc. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> there are milder forms of being blinded, like if right now from here we stepped into a very bright room or, you know, today there's not much sunlight left, but uh, uh, let's say it was a bright sunshine or so, you would also temporarily be overwhelmed, right? And sometimes your eyes hurt because you stepped out in the, you know, uh, uh, into the uh, uh, snow or something like that. Huh? Um, and so uh, in that case, the light isn't intense mm. enough to actually bleach uh, a significant portion of your, your opsins. But what happens there is that you start to saturate uh, this biochemical machinery here. Yeah? Uh, I told you there's a lot of gain involved. A single one of these will change the ionic flow by about uh, a million ions or so. Yeah? And so uh, this, can, this can get saturated quite easily. So if you hit the photoreceptor with a lot of uh, um, uh, photons, then all of the channels will shut down. All, uh, every single one of the membrane channels closes, and then you, know, you can't do any more than that. You can't modulate that any further. So the photoreceptor is temporarily blinded, even though there's still plenty of opsin to go around. Yeah? But then you have to wait for this cascade to be shut off in the way we discussed a moment ago, for it to be able to go again and uh, for you to be able to see again. So you can get uh, temporarily blinded at different stages if you want, depending on, on which part gets saturated. Um, okay, uh, so much for a structure of, of rhodopsin. Well, what, uh, what's the structure of olfactory receptor proteins? Um, <clears throat> here's an example of the structure of an olfactory receptor. And um, uh, you might notice that they're drawn very similarly. Well, it's because uh, in fact, uh, what we believe about the structure of olfactory receptors is entirely dependent on what uh, we know about the structure of rhodopsin. This was solved by X-ray crystallography. It's actually possible to make crystals of rhodopsin and uh, diffract X-rays off of them and get the real atomic structure of the protein. This I, I call fantasy because uh, uh, it's uh, based on the sequence similarity between the, olfact the genes for the olfactory receptor and the genes for uh, rhodopsin. And so uh, people who, uh, who understand molecular dynamics will take the sequence of this protein and kind of align it in a way that uh, makes use of what we've know learned about the scaffolding here of rhodopsin and in a way that takes into account the particular amino acid side chains and how they might fit into in, 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 in with each other and so on. And so this was essentially computed here. This is our best guess as to the protein structure of uh, one of the human olfactory receptors. And the little uh, P's that are drawn in here are sites on this uh, structure where people think that it's most likely that uh, these small molecules that are odorants will bind and actually cause some kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, interact with the protein and cause some kind of change in its shape. And not surprisingly, these sites are in the same place as uh, uh, the, um, the chromophore sits in the rhodopsin molecule, yeah? because this is effectively a small molecule binding site yeah? in the inside of the rhodopsin. So one can think about it the other way, actually. Um, you, can, you can imagine that rhodopsin is really a chemoreceptor. And, uh, it senses, it smells, if you want, this uh, aldehyde, this aldehyde molecule. Yeah? It turns out that aldehydes are actually very strong uh, smells. They are very effective olfactants. Um, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, the smell of freshly cut grass 
is uh, almost entirely an, an, an aldehyde. It's something like uh, a 9 carbon or 10 carbon aldehyde. Yeah. Now, this is actually a fairly heavy molecule, high, relatively high molecular weight. It, has, uh, it uh, doesn't evaporate easily, so it has a very low uh, vapor pressure, and yet you smell it very strongly. Yeah. Um, another aldehyde smell is, uh, is olive oil. The, the sort of characteristic of olive oil is, is largely uh, a, a mixture of large um, long-chain aldehydes. Yeah. So, in general, if you compare different small molecules in the ability to cause a smell in their effectiveness as uh, odorants, you find that the aldehydes have very high binding constants. They, they are effective at very low concentrations. So it's interesting in that context that uh, rhodopsin, the uh, receptor protein for vision, binds an aldehyde. And it binds it in a place that uh, is plausible as being the binding site in the olfactory receptors as well. So we can think about rhodopsin really as being a smell receptor, as being a chemoreceptor that happens to uh, be, uh, be selective for a light-sensitive chemical. Yeah, because this chromophore, this uh, retinaldehyde, is light-sensitive. It flips from this to that when light hits it. So my thinking, and this isn't just my thinking, is that uh, uh, there might be some evolutionary truth to this, that perhaps you know, very early forms of life, early protozoa, had uh, uh, chemoreceptors, probably you know, the first cell that uh, any self-respecting cell is uh, going to try to sense its chemical environment in one way or another. So these chemoreceptors evolved, and at some point a lucky protozoan or other hit on this option to uh, uh, bind, to have its chemoreceptor bind a light-sensitive chemical. And then in short order that turned into the ability to see and or, or to, to sense light and to follow light and to then perhaps uh, uh, perform photosynthesis or things like that. Yeah. So um, um, the, uh, uh, this, this relationship is, is, not, is not just fanciful. Um, uh, as I said, the, the uh, uh, olfactory receptors are the strongest, have the strongest homology of uh, G-protein coupled receptors to rhodopsin. And uh, there's this interesting functional similarity whereby the rhodopsin is essentially a chemoreceptor for a light-sensitive molecule. So I think I've shown you at several stages along the way, going sort of zo zooming in gradually, that uh, there is a good amount of similarity between these two uh, sensory systems at the level of um, so kind of cells and subcellular structure biochemistry and molecules that, uh, that we're somewhat more comfortable with. Uh, I want to zoom out now and uh, look more at what happens in the networks that, that process this information and uh, see if there are any interesting similarities there that we could maybe make use of to understand one system by the other, yeah? Isn't it interesting, like, eyes evolve more than one species? Does something like that evolve only once or more than once? Um, so, um, looking at, uh, at different species, if you... Uh, um, if you compare vertebrates and invertebrates, you see that there are um, slight differences in this transduction cascade. So in particular, in the, uh, in the fly, or in, in insects in general, the uh, photoreceptor, um, this channel opens rather than closes. Um, so there's, there's a change in sign. There's also, th uh, they also use a, a different second messenger here. So, um, yeah, you're right, it's, it's thought that uh, this, uh, this transduction system has evolved uh, uh, several times, although there's also an indication that uh, the same molecular components keep getting reused. Uh, even if, uh, even if the, the, uh, the event happened several times throughout evolution, we recognize that nature kept reusing the same comp components. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, so again, uh, components got reused a lot. So rhodopsin, for example, is remarkably conserved, yeah? So if you compare uh, this uh, between vertebrates and invertebrates, a lot of similarity. Bacterial rhodopsin, uh, you know, bacteria that use a, um, uh, they use a rhodopsin in order not uh, to see but uh, to uh, uh, gain energy, 
uh, they use the li uh, energy of the light in order to pump protons across the membrane and turn it into ATP ultimately. Bacterial rhodopsin has a lot of structural similarity to this uh, uh, visual rhodopsin. Yeah. So even though it's, it's used biophysically, it's used in a different way. Yeah. So um, um, a good amount of, uh, of uh, similarity across uh, evolutionary events that uh, uh, may well have you know, arisen independently, but uh, keep reusing same, the same genes and the same components. Yeah, maybe that happened more than once, yeah. Uh, you might have also heard of this uh, um, interesting discovery a few years ago of a, a sort of a master regulatory gene that controls eye development. It's called uh, PAC6, and there are other genes uh, uh, like it. Um, and it was, uh, uh, the interesting thing is that it, uh, um, it controls the development of the eye both in insects and in, and in people, uh, in, in, in mammals, even though the eyes have completely different structure, right? The insect eye is sort of the inside out version of our eye. Um, so anatomically, a completely different structure at the molecular level, there are some similarities. But the gene that uh, controls, seems to sort of control the, uh, uh, the production of the structure is identical. Uh, in flies and humans. You can take the human gene, put it in a fly, and it'll replace the function of the fly gene just fine. Yeah? Uh, another interesting sideline to that is that this so-called master regulatory gene, the PAC6 gene, uh, uh, controls not only eye development, but nose development too. Um, so uh, the, uh, um, the, the, the mice that don't have PAC6 are deficient in nose development as well, and, uh, and it seems to regulate the appearance of that structure in a similar way as it does the eye. So uh, um, it, it seems that at least the same components seem to be uh, kind of reused for, for a function that uh, maybe got lost at some point and then reacquired. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, I promised I was going to zoom out again uh, to see what happens at the, at the network level. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's just uh, take the first step. So the photoreceptors, uh, they do the light transduction and then uh, change their synaptic transmitter release and they talk to the second order neurons in the retina. These are called bipolar cells. And bipolar cells are fairly simple. They're kind of straight up and down neurons. They get their input at one end and they send it to uh, the other end. Uh, they don't uh, themselves do a lot of sort of integration. Uh, each bipolar cell collects from uh, one or a few photoreceptors and it sends its output to uh, uh, several uh, third order neurons, amacrine cells and ganglion cells. But pretty much the information flow in the retina is kind of uh, straight uh, up and down from photoreceptor to bipolar cells. It's quite different in the olfactory system and so I want to spend more time on that. In the olfactory system, remember, the receptor cells are all in the in the epithelium that lines the nasal cavity, whereas the circuitry that processes their output is in the olfactory bulb. There's actually a thin plate of bone in between, yeah, so uh, uh, that, that holds the brain, uh, keeps the brain separate from the nasal cavity. This plate of bone has uh, small holes in it, and the axons of the receptor neurons have to find their way uh, through those holes to get to the olfactory bulb. Well, what does that connectivity look like? Um, Something remarkable happens here. I told you that uh, we have many different types of um, olfactory receptors. We have about 350 types of olfactory receptor neurons. Each olfactory receptor neuron expresses just one kind of olfactory receptor protein. Yeah? And so we have about 350 different genes for olfactory receptor proteins. Mice have about 1,000 different genes for olfactory receptor proteins. Now that's out of a total of maybe 30,000 genes. So for a mouse, a mouse, 3% of its genome are dedicated to just making different olfactory receptors. Yeah, so it's, it's a, I, I, I think it's a huge proportion. Um, but even in our case, it's 1%. That's still a large number, large fraction of the genes that are just dedicated to making different, uh, allowing us to smell different things. Um, okay, so uh, in, in, in a mouse, let's just focus on mouse because I'll show you a lot of uh, results from mice in a moment. Um, <clears throat> there are about a thousand different types of olfactory receptor neurons and they are sprinkled pretty much higgledy-piggledy throughout the olfactory epithelium. Um, 
Yeah, there's kind of like salt and pepper. They're all mixed together. There's a little bit of order, but it's not terribly interesting. Um, uh, so uh, any receptor is more or less equally likely to reside next to any other receptor. Um, <clears throat> but then something dramatic happens when their axons travel to the olfactory bulb and make connections there. And the dramatic thing you already see here is that all the receptors of one type, the ones that are green here, say type 337, all those receptors, wherever they are in the epithelium, they send their axons to the same place in the olfactory bulb. They all converge to one place. And uh, there's about 10,000 of these coming together in this small region about uh, 100 microns across. And the technical term for that region is a glomerulus. A glomerulus is Latin for small ball because that's what they make. They make a small ball of neuropil, of neural fibers, in the uh, uh, surface of the olfactory bulb. I'll show you some pictures of what that looks like. Um, the, uh, another type of receptor sends all its axons to another address. You know, they form a glomerulus here, and these receptors form a glomerulus here. The surface of the bulb is packed densely with glomeruli, so they are, uh, they are packed together like uh, a, a dense layer of peas, yeah? And there's about uh, 2,000 of them on the surface of the bulb. Uh, it turns out that uh, there's two glomeruli for every receptor type, so 1,000 receptor types, two glomeruli, um, and uh, they are arranged about uh, in mirror symmetry between the left side and the right side of the bulb. Those are details. The important thing is that the connection from the epithelium to the bulb acts like a switchboard in a way. So all the neurons that have the same kind of thing to say because they bind the same kinds of chemicals send their axons to the same location in the olfactory bulb. So it's a way for the nervous system to collect together all these signals that are from the same kind of neuron and start processing them in, uh, in a collective fashion and collect the signals from another type of neuron somewhere else. So this has an important consequence uh, on the kind of pattern of activity that, uh, uh, that uh, is produced in the brain and this part of the brain when an odor hits. So <clears throat> let's think about this for a moment. So a given um, odorant, let's say, um, um, you know, butyraldehyde. Uh, butyraldehyde is... Uh, um, it uh, smells a bit like throw up or like the uh, movie popcorn. Um, uh, that, that uh, uh, in fact, it's, it, it's the essential ingredient in artificial butter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, aldehyde uh, might uh, bind strongly to the uh, green receptors and somewhat more weakly to the red receptors and perhaps not at all to the blue receptors. Yeah. Uh, on the epithelium, that'll just produce a sort of salt and pepper mix of active and inactive neurons, yeah, but they're all higgledy-piggledy uh, distributed together. On the bulb, on the other hand, it'll produce a strong pattern of activity, strong activity level in this glomerulus, weak activity level in that glomerulus, and no activity in that glomerulus. Yeah. So on the olfactory bulb, we'll get a real spatial patterning of activity now as a result of this single olfactory molecule coursing or, or you know, uh, this vapor coursing through the, uh, over the epithelium, whereas within the epithelium there was no recognizable pattern. Yeah. So this, what this projection does is it turns uh, kind of a, uh, a salt and pepper pattern of activity on the epithelium into a very clear spot-like pattern on the olfactory bulb. And I want to show you in a few pictures, actually, how much time do we have? What's, what's the timing of this event? OK. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, <coughs> so I want to show you a few pictures of what these activity patterns look like. Yeah? Um, so how do we know what they look like? Well, it turns out that you can, you can watch this activity uh, on the surface of the brain. Uh, more or less directly, and here's how we do these experiments. Uh, we anesthetize an animal, a, a rat or a mouse typically, uh, cut a small hole in the skull so you can look down on the surface of the olfactory bulb. We put a window on the, over the top so that uh, it, it stays clear. And then we just take a video of what goes on on the surface of the olfactory bulb. We take the video in red light, so we shine a deep red light on there. And then we stimulate the animal with a, an apparatus, a robot we built that produces many different uh, kinds of odors. So the remarkable thing is that you can just look down on the surface of the brain 
and see the regions of the brain that are active and distinguish them from the ones that are inactive. And uh, uh, the, uh, the reason is that uh, active regions of the brain where neurons are firing a lot, they somehow change their reflectance a little bit. It's about a very tiny amount. It's about a part in a thousand or so. A very, very kind of small change in reflectance. But if you analyze these images carefully, you can see it. Yeah? So let me show you an example. So <clears throat> here's an image of what you might see uh, uh, looking into that window. Uh, these are the two olfactory bulbs, right side and left side. The nose of the animal is here. The tail is over here. This is about four or five millimeters. And uh, this is an image you take before the odor appears. And this is an image you get after the odor or during the odor presentation. Now, you might say that these two images are not uh, very different, right? But if you look very closely, so uh, if you, if you uh, take the ratio of this image divided by that image, so at each point in the image you divide this intensity by that intensity, and then you look very closely, you find that in fact there are some dark spots in this image. And they're dark, they're not very dark, otherwise we'd see them directly, yeah? But uh, they are darker by about a part in a thousand, a yeah, tenth of a percent. And it turns out, uh, you can convince yourself in various ways, that each of these spots is one glomerulus. It's one of these small regions of uh, neuropil where the axons from the receptor cells arrive. Yeah? Uh, let me show you some, some more images. Uh, this is uh, uh, an image we got uh, just recently. It's using a somewhat different method. Uh, rather than this uh, kind of passive imaging with red light and looking at the reflection, here uh, we used a transgenic mouse uh, whose olfactory receptor cells are modified so that they fluoresce when they release a neurotransmitter. Yeah, it's a fantastic tool, this mouse, uh, because it allows you to see the, the glomeruli that are active just light up in, in green fluorescence. Yeah? So otherwise, the, the method is the same. You just image the brain under uh, various odor presentations. And here are all the, the glomeruli that appear in this fluorescence image under a, a panel of about 100 different odors. Now, any given odor activates only a small number of these glomeruli. Yeah? So for example, uh, this odor here that I can't even pronounce uh, activates out of all the you know, thousands or so glomeruli that are present, it activates only about uh, three or four on each side of the olfactory bulb. Yeah? And this odor produces a different pattern, and this odor produces yet another pattern. Yeah? So by this method, we can actually uh, see, directly see, the patterns of activity that a given odor or mixture of odors or odor object produces on the surface of the olfactory bulb. Now, um, there's an interesting parallel now between the visual system and the olfactory system. If we look at the level of the uh, second order neurons, uh, in the retina, uh, a given object, a given visual object, produces a pattern of activity that's pretty much the image of that visual object because uh, you know, photons fly in a straight line, so the image in the outside world gets produced, produces an image on the retina. Photoreceptors connect to bipolar cells. Nothing much interesting changes, but because of the simplicity of geometric objects, there's a direct correspondence between this pattern of activity uh, among the bipolar cells in the retina and, the, pattern and the, the actual visual pattern of the object that we're interested in. On the olfactory bulb, a given object, uh, say, you know, coffee, uh, produces a pattern of activity among these glomeruli that I've just uh, schematized here. Um, <clears throat> but again, it's similar as in the retina. There are some strongly active regions and some less active regions and some completely inactive regions. The point is that an object that the animal ultimately is interested in gets converted into a pattern, a spatial pattern of activity. So now you can imagine that uh, um, the kind of circuitry, obviously there's some high level circuitry needed in order to go from here uh, further, in order to uh, turn this uh, spatial pattern of activity into our internal you know, concept of a chair, in order to recognize a chair, in order to distinguish different chairs, in order to store the object in memory, in order to uh, call it back up. So you can imagine that a whole, you know, a whole large portion of cortex is dedicated to interpreting these spatial patterns of activity among retinal neurons. The interesting thing is that you can imagine taking all that same circuitry and simply connecting it up to the olfactory bulb and now interpreting these patterns of activity, 
and it, it could perform the same functions. It could serve to detect olfactory objects. It could serve to discriminate one olfactory object from another. It could serve to store those objects in memory, recall them later. In principle, if you have a machine, some kind of neural machine, that can deal with these patterns of activity and interpret them as objects, then you could take that same machine and connect it up to this front end, and it'll, uh, it'll detect and process olfactory objects. Yeah? So what nature has done in the first few stages of the sensory system is it's con it has converted to um, different, very different kinds of sensory inputs, you know, light in one case and uh, vapor in another case, taken two very different kinds of, of physical stimuli and converted them into compatible neural representations. And the conversion is such that an object an entity that we're interested in gets converted into a spatial pattern of activity on some neural surface. In this case, it's the surface of the olfactory bulb. In this case, it's the surface of the retina. And so the information is now put into a compatible form that can be dealt with in pretty much the same way in both sensory systems for further interpretation. Now, if we had more time, or if you're going to come back, uh, <laughs> uh, I, can, uh, I can tell you a second part about the kinds of networks that uh, begin to do this pattern processing. It turns out this pattern processing already begins in the retina and it already begins in the olfactory bulb. And we can start to see some similarities even at that stage, where how the pattern gets processed, how it gets, uh, how it gets refined, and how it gets converted into, into a more efficient uh, form. We can see similarities there, and that's sort of where our current interest lies in the lab, is to exploit these similarities. because. The retina has been studied for a very long time, and we know quite a bit about its circuitry, and there are a lot of interesting things that have come out. And we're trying to employ these insights and what we understand about the circuitry of, of early vision to see if we can ad adapt it, if we can adapt those insights and apply them to the circuitry of early olfa olfaction in the olfactory bulb. And like I said, I'll tell you about that some other time. Thank you. Thank you.